On the 19th of June, 1215, Bad King John gave his seal to the Magna Carta. But what did he do for today's family historian? Building an audio library for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. You're listening to Talk Genealogy. Here's your presenter, Malcolm Noble. Hello everyone, thank you for being there and welcome to the monthly podcast for genealogists like you and me with too much time on their hands. You know, I've held back from recording an episode about the Great Charter, wanting the dust to settle after all the media coverage of the anniversary two years back, so that we can come to the subject in what you might call the cool light of day. I promise I am not going to impose yet another account of the history. Well, perhaps just a little. What Englishman could stay clear of talking about earls and barons and knights? Thank goodness Ivanhoe doesn't appear in the script. Crikey, I'd be going on about it for hours. Now, not for the first time, we are approaching a massive subject, and I will want to recommend just a few books that will clear the cloudy skies and make sure that we've got the full picture. Now, some of these books are quite thick, though they're not quite doorstop, but I'm mentioning them because, well, I think they're pretty essential. I'll also be pointing out previous episodes of this podcast that you may want to revisit just to expand a little on some of the subjects and sources that I will be talking about tonight. More about that later. And you know, for the second episode recently, I need to apologise because tonight's natter is going to stretch beyond that 30-minute boundary that I usually set myself. I try hard and guard against that, but you know, I really didn't want to split this too obviously into two episodes. So I hope that you'll bear with me. Now, notwithstanding that, I do need to slip in just a couple or three quick notes. Firstly, this episode was originally recorded as episode 18 for posting in January. But I've had to reschedule it because the calendar is somewhat backing up, folks. (laughs) So I'm sure you'll notice some clumsy editing where I've messed around with the numbers and the dates. I hope it doesn't get in the way too much. It reminds me of the days when I used to splice recording tape with razor blades and stick the ends together again. Another piece of news, some of you may have already picked up that I've opened a Facebook page for the podcast. Search for Talk Genealogy Podcast. Not much going on there at the moment, but I wanted to provide you with an extra option for commenting on the different episodes, and especially an opportunity for asking questions. Which leads me to my regular caution. Please remember that I'm neither a professional nor an expert. I'm an enthusiast like you, who has spent more than 50 years digging up his family tree, usually in the wrong place. And these podcasts are really no more than me sharing with you some of the lessons that I've learnt along the way. Some people like to look on the Magna Carta as the baronage, the upper middle class of England, if you like, recognising their English identity. Now, I'm not quite so sure about this myself. After all, French remain the language. But yes, I I do concede that they were reluctant to fight overseas wars, and with the loss of Normandy, they may have felt that those links were being weakened. But we do need to bear in mind, however, that in the years following Magna Carta, immigration from France continued, although it did change in its nature just a little bit with the loss of Normandy. King John went too far too far in extracting tax, which some of the barons had no chance of paying, it was just beyond their reach, and too far in encroaching on their liberties, confiscation, usury and imprisonment, sometimes imprisonment of families. The barons, it has to be said, were a unruly lot. History reads as if some of them would have preferred any conflict rather than any resolution. But they came together, largely facilitated by the Church, and set out their Charter of Liberties as a solution to the baronial wars. Now, Charles Browning, in his book on the descendants of the Magna Carta barons, tells us rather romantically, 
On Trinity Monday, June 15th, King John came out from the city, attended by Langton and Marshall and a few supporters, and occupied the royal tent on Runnymede. He was astonished at the baronial array, and saw that it would be folly to retract or temporise again. The chief barons went into the royal tent. Preliminaries having been arranged and carried out, ceremony was dispensed with, and business was quickly and firmly arranged. The engrossed copy of Magna Carta was read over by the Earl of Pembroke to the King, and compared with the schedule and articles also submitted to John, and spread before him for his final act. There was an almost breathless silence in the royal tent, and in the great multitude without, whilst the King confirmed the Magna Carta by a solemn oath, and placed his seal to the precious instrument, June 15th, 1215 in the seventeenth year of his reign, and then was heard, even to London, a great shout of victory. Hmm, well perhaps I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> so how can the ceremony in 1215 help today's family historian, especially if you haven't traced your ancestry further back than Tudor times, Goodness me, there must be a gap of 12 generations, and there's the Black Death between your family research and the meadow at Runnymede. Well, I did say we had too much time on our hands, didn't I? <laughs> okay, the first reason. It's interesting, and it's a story full of names and links between families, and browsing through that sort of thing, well, that's how we spent our winter evenings, isn't it? Secondly, and just a little more seriously, it will help us prepare for when your family tree does reach back to the 13th century, as I'm sure that it will. You've probably heard me describe a picture of the extended twigs of our pedigree reaching back, while the increasing number of branches of the older families are reaching forward. Surely it's inevitable that they will meet. And it's going to help if we are familiar with the relationships between those major families because it is the prominent families that we're going to connect with. They are the ones that left their footprints. David Carpenter, a Magna Carta specialist, compliments one of his predecessors, Professor J.C. Holt, for taking time to understand the links between the different families. Now, Carpenter wrote, and I'm reading from his 2015 um, penguin on Magna Carta. He wrote this about Holt. Unlike previous historians of the period, Holt started not with the king, but with a vast amount of research into the histories of baronial and knightly families. He focused on the north, because it was the northerners, as they were called at the time, who took the lead in the rebellion that led to Magna Carta. Holt gained a unique understanding of the complex ties of lordship, neighbourhood, friendship and family that held together the local society on which John's government impacted. And you know, it seemed like a good idea for us to do the same. Here's some earlier episodes of the podcast. Episode 15, Let's Talk of Graves, of Worms, of Epitaphs. Episode 13 was about the hearth tax. Episode 12, and it was Shakespeare, for example. Episode 9 discussed the medieval pipe rolls. Go to episode 7 for the companions of William the Conqueror. Episode 2, the Herald's Visitations. And our very first episode looked at working with Judah Wills. Building an audio library for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. Now... Here's reason number three. If you are researching different branches in Tudor England, so you've gone back as far as parish registers will take you, it must be certain that several of your direct ancestors will have lived through the turbulent times of the baronial wars. 
Okay, it may take some years, many, many years, to identify them and establish the links, but that doesn't reduce the probability that they were there. Do the arithmetic. Multiples of 12 generations for each of your 16th century ancestors. Reduce that number for a significant number of cousins and intermarriages, and some, though probably not much, migration. Now, how surely are the days of the Magna Carta relevant? Even if we cannot identify your ancestors at the moment, we should be confident that they were there and we want to know as much about their England as we can absorb. Okay, then let's get down to the nitty gritty. I like to think of the four dates, 1066, 1086, 1215, and 1279 as punctuation marks through an otherwise dark age of English genealogy. Of course, there are other sources for that period. The Pipe Roll of 1130, recently republished by the Pipe Roll Society, is important because it's an early example of the Pipe Rolls and yes, provides a good body of genealogical detail but it was never a broad, encompassing project. And of course, the details vary according to the type of entry, and there's little opportunity to attach it to or compare it with other evidence. Now, once we get into the 14th century, we have many more reliable exchequer and legal records to search through. Now, you may want to go back to episode nine of this podcast, where I talk about the pipe rolls. Go to the website talkgenealogy.blog and the link will be there. But before the great hundred roll of 1279, we are struggling somewhat. So we have 1066 and the Battle Abbey roll, listing the Companions of the Conqueror. Very much disputed in its different historical versions but today we can come down to 15 definite names and 6 probables. Now episode 7 of this podcast discussed the Battle Abbey Roll. And by the way, it is one of the three most consistently downloaded episodes of the Talk Genealogy podcast. So that's 1066. The Doomsday Book set out in detail in 1086 how those companion families had been rewarded and how they were beginning to emerge in what we might call a new middle class. Then we jump forward four generations to the Magna Carta, before reaching further forward to 1279 and the pipe roll. Now the 1279 survey might have been an attempt at a second doomsday book. In fact, it was far more detailed than original doomsday. It deserves a detailed study in itself. But the main disadvantage for the genealogist is that only a portion of it has survived, and that's particularly the Midlands and the East Anglia sections. Now, the obvious distinction here is that while the Battle Abbey roll was a military muster, Doomsday was a census of sorts, and the 127900s roll was another survey, the Magna Carta was just a record of an agreement, and although she does have a list of names, especially those barons who acted as sureties, its true value for the genealogist is the evidence it gives of how those families were developing, not only politically and economically, but also I suppose what you could call reproductively. Now, before we go any further, I need to mention again the work of Catherine Keats Rohan, who has written two important books in this area, Doomsday People, where she looks at the background of the people mentioned in the Great Survey, and then Doomsday Descendants, where she looks at what happened to their line. Now, one sells for £150 and the other one goes for about £80. So here we have a brace of volumes that you wouldn't want to jump into without a little thought beforehand. Although Catherine is an expert in this specific niche, so I'm sure that what she has to say represents value for money. Her work really centres on prosopography. 
rather than genealogy. And if you recognise Catherine's name, it may be because we considered her work in more detail in episode 18, I think. Yes, that's the one. As usual, the link is on the website, and now, of course, it's on the Facebook page if you'd like to revisit it. So, although we started tonight's talk by acknowledging that the times of Magna Carta might seem remote if our researchers got no further than the early Tudor period, and that researching the pre-modern period may feel like stepping alone into some unsupported territories away from many of the sources that we may be familiar with, I hope that I'm pointing to some reassurance that we are able to draw on plenty of serious and even comprehensive work on this period that has already been done. Some I've already mentioned, and I will indicate others as I go on, both in this episode and in future episodes on Doomsday. Hopefully this clutch of discussions will mean that when we plunge into episodes about broader and deeper medieval genealogy, the subject won't be as intimidating as it might at first appear. Anyway, that's the plan. <laughs> so let's look at the England of Bad King John. About three and a half million souls. Much disputed that figure, but if we're going to settle anywhere, that's the sort of uh, figure. And it means about three quarters of a million households. And if we accept this analysis, and I'm taking it straight from textbooks, we'd probably notice less children than we might expect. Now, there were usually about a dozen earls in England during King John's reign, probably something less than 150 barons. Both the barons and the earls held estates. Below them were the knights, and there could have been as many as four and a half thousands of these, according to one source. And they came from a broad spectrum of society. Some were a little different than other free tenants, while others enjoyed an income that might suit a wealthy baron. The clauses in the charter, usually called chapters, can help the genealogists understand some of the conventions of inheritance at the time. The conditions of minors wives and widows are carefully detailed but it is a restrictive view of society when the charter talks about every free englishman it is not celebrating our commitment to liberty but indicating the exclusion of the unfree 90 percent of the population might be termed peasantry either free or unfree. That breaking down to a proportion of about 60-40, but it varied. In East Anglia, for example, the area that I mainly research, uh, had a much higher proportion of uh, free men. Now this world is cleverly, perhaps astutely is a better word, explained in two books that I want to recommend. Magna Carta by David Carpenter. It was published in 2015, a penguin to coincide with the anniversary, and it examines the charter pretty much from every angle. Now, if you're serious about studying your family's history in the era, you're going to have to read this one quite carefully. Take your time over it. It comes in just short of 600 pages, but by the end, believe me, you'll know your stuff. Now, Magna Carta by Holt was the standard work of the previous generation, published in 1965 and revised in 1995. By no means is it replaced by Carpenter, it shows an amazing perception of the chart in its historical context. Carpenter acknowledges Holt, indeed he recommends him, and I have to say that uh, Holt has been one of my favourite historians since I read his popular work on the Robin Hood legend. You can trust what he tells you. I also want to recommend the Blood Royal chapter in Anthony Wagner's essential work on English genealogy. Wagner, who spent the greater part of his career in the College of Arms, puts this whole debate about searching into medieval family history 
into a neat and balanced perspective. Also, catch up on his chapter about feudalism. Now, 25 of the barons were commissioned to act as sureties for the charter. If you like, they were meant to police it and act together if the king went astray. Now, please excuse the accent and pronunciation. Are you ready? Here we go. Lord of Beaver Castle, William Dalbany. The Earls of Norfolk, Hugh and Roger Le Bigod. Henry de Boham, Gilbert and Richard de Clare, John Fitz Robert, the Lord of Dunmo Castle, Robert Fitz Walter, the Earl of Albemarle, the Mayor of the City of London, William de Hardle, William de Huntingfield, John de Lacey, William Langvalley, William Mallet, Geoffrey de Mondeville, William Marshall Jr., Earl of Pembroke, the Justice of the King's Forest, Richard de Montfichet, Roger and William de Mowbray, Richard de Percy, the Earl of Winchester, Sarah de Quincy, Robert de Roos, Geoffrey de Say, Robert de Vere, and Eustace de Vestry. So those are the 25 barons. You know, this sounds like a good moment to remind you that the show notes for tonight's and previous podcasts can be found on the website talkgenealogy.blog. I'll try and keep those notes short and to the point. Really, I just use the space to indicate the sources or links that I've mentioned. The website does have a complete bibliography of all the books mentioned across the episodes with all the publishing details and the uh, source details where I have them. The website also carries a blog, a little bit about me, and some pointers to the other work that I'm doing. So I hope that you'll grab a couple of minutes just to take a look at it. You're listening to Talk Genealogy, the monthly podcast for genealogists with too much time on their hands. If you were listening 12 months ago, it's likely that you'll be picking up the bonus episodes in which I drew on conversations I'd had with American enthusiasts in England. Now that recording is still available, so let's do a little bit of eavesdropping. Here's a couple of snippets from that bonus episode. Building an audio library for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. Our fathers moved from the country to the towns. Folks usually stayed on home ground, I say within the next but one parish. Now I'm sure it can be tempting when an internet search throws up a William Cartwright of the right age. 80 miles from a girl with the right name. But you know, that is very unlikely to be the right William Carr. Like you, I've come across several hundred grandparents, and mine all have one thing in common. They all knew their place. My grandmother shared a secret. Her father grew up on the wrong side of the Thames. Centuries before, Matilda wouldn't marry her duke because he was a bastard. Two women who had no doubt about their place in the scheme of things. The strategy which I recommend to English researchers is to build on and strengthen the oral and the family traditions for the past hundred years. Then draw on the census to carry us back through Victorian times. Again, strengthening and reinforcing, often correcting what it tells us. Hopefully we'll then find the village or the knot of villages where a particular branch of our family tree was embedded prior to the Industrial Revolution. And hopefully this will take us back to the commencement of the Paris Registers, when we will need to identify gateway ancestors, and you will, who will help us back There we are, an excerpt from 12 months ago. As I say, the link is still available. It's there on the episode page of the website. But tonight our subject is family history and the Magna Carta. At the end of the 19th century, a party of Americans set up one of their hereditary clubs for Americans who can trace their history 
back to those barons. Now that's okay, it spawns some good research. But let's not pretend that such a descent is in any way special. By the way, there's also a club for people who are descended from Lady Godiva. I'm thinking of uh, enlisting in that one. I'm tempted, I must say. However, the club has produced a series of books of pedigrees connecting their members to the barons. The first edition, 1898, included, I think, 56 pedigrees from 18 barons. So, far from being a complete genealogy, it's more like a thread of wool in a whole knitted cardigan. The book has been reprinted and revised in several later editions, so perhaps it's unfair of me to criticise what is a Victorian book of genealogy. Having said that, even for this period, the book does not make it easy to verify the pedigrees which it presents, and sometimes they are not tabulated in the best way. Sometimes they go up, sometimes they go down, and sometimes they go up and down in the same note. Now, fortunately, the details have been shaped up elsewhere, and I particularly like the section on Magna Carta descents in York Larry Wilson's Virginia Carolina genealogy. Now, I've mentioned this book before, and it's one of my favourites to browse through, and that's because it sets out what can be intricate as well as sweeping genealogies in an easy-to-follow and an easy-to-stomach text format. York Larry Wilson shows us the families of the sureties to the Charter were interrelated. Now here, rather amusingly, is an extreme example which he has quoted from Browning. was the mother of Sayer de Quincy. His wife's brother married a sister of the father-in-law of Sayer de Quincy. His brother-in-law married the aunt of the wife of Sayer de Quincy. His paternal grandfather was a brother of the paternal great-grandfather of William Marshall, Jr. His great-aunt married an ancestor of Richard de Montfaucher. He was a cousin of the paternal great-grandmother of William Marshall, Jr. His ancestor, the first Earl of Clare's wife, was of the same family as that of Robert de Vere. His maternal grandmother's brother was the grandfather of the wife of the son of Sayre de Quincy, was the wife of the grandson of William de Mowbray. His paternal grandfather was a brother of the paternal grandmother of Robert de Vere. His aunt was the mother of Robert de Mowbray. His granddaughter married a grandnephew of Roger de Mowbray. His mother's second husband was a cousin of William de Albany. His grandfather's brother was the maternal great-grandfather of the wife of Hubert of the mother-in-law of Eustace de Vesti, of the son-in-law of William Lanfally, and of the second husband of a granddaughter of Sir de Quincy. Now, as well as the sureties, Charles Browning went as far as listing the barons who were for and against the king, giving 130 names on one side and 110 on the other. And it's clear that some of these families were on both sides. Uh, and also, I'm not absolutely sure what constitutes being for and against. And it wasn't an immovable feast in any case. But it does give us the names. And here is an example of how we can uh, use those lists of names when we're browsing through the books. Now, many of those enthusiasts who have traced their line back to these times will be descended from Elizabeth de Vermandois. She was the child bride of Robert de Beaumont, first Earl of Leicester, who fought with the Conqueror on Senlac Hill. And she later married William de Warren, second Earl of Surrey. There is a rumour that she started the second relationship before she'd properly finished with the first, but she's not here to comment, so we'll move on. Both of Elizabeth's marriages produced a healthy clutch of offspring, who all enjoyed a good start in life. It is said that she's the matriarch of counted well-known families. Well then, she must also be the ancestor of countless unknown families. And we can see here that her descendants were supporting both sides at Runnymede. Warren, Earl of Surrey, a strong supporter of the king, 
while Elizabeth's daughter, Isabel, who had been a mistress of King Henry I of England, and had married into the Clare family, now two of the sureties. These pedigrees have been published widely. I've taken them from York Larry Wilson, but if you search for genealogies of the Magna Carta sureties or Magna Carta barons, you'll soon find them. I want to add two caveats to tonight's episode. Remember, we should never accept a genealogy simply because it appears in print. We need to either identify the source and verify it, or go to other sources to corroborate it. Secondly, I am not suggesting that we should begin with these old families and, working forward, try to connect our family tree. Absolutely not. The golden rule of genealogy is that we start with what we know and we go backwards a step at a time and verifying each step. But I am saying that things will be a lot easier if we gain an understanding of how the old families developed and grew in the early modern period. They constitute the landscape of our search. But why bother to build up a knowledge of these families? I can hear you saying surely it's more efficient to wait until we sense a connection and then get to work. You know, I'm tempted to argue that you'll find this useful because I found it useful and clearly that's not an approach that I'd be comfy with or is likely to persuade you. What I can say is this, a familiarity with the families of early England is like having an avenue of lanterns through what I've called the Dark Age of English genealogy. Arithmetic tells us that we are very likely to be related to some of these families. Experience tells us that it's very difficult to find those links because there are so few sources. Remember how David Carpenter identified Holt's research into the links and the development of these families as a key to understanding the period. And finally, a word about King John. Yes, he deserves to be called Bad King John. But remember that the barons weren't such a great bunch. There wasn't a leader or statesman amongst them. The Magna Carta owes more to Stephen Langton than anyone else, and it was the barons who reneged on the deal long before the king did. Now, there's something to argue over. Now, when I was roughing out tonight's podcast, I wanted to find space to mention another of my well-used books. But while it didn't really seem to fit neatly into the subject as I thought it might, so I'm going to recommend it here. It's called Pedigrees from the Plea Rolls, collected from the pleadings in the various courts of law, 1200 to 1500, from the original rolls in the Public Records Office, and it's been compiled by George Wortley. Now, Watersley worked in the PRO at the turn of the 20th century, compiling a history of Staffordshire. And as he researched pipe rolls, he came across many cases where the genealogies could be drawn from the evidence. Usually these are no more than two or three generations, but they can be more. He published them from time to time in the genealogist magazines, and you can still find them there. And then he brought them together in this little book, I say little book, it's over 500 pages, in 1908. The big disadvantage is it's not comprehensive, it doesn't pretend to be, and the entries have been selected by, well, no more than chance, really, but as I say, it extends to over 500 pages. Now, I have seen a free download available on the internet, but please, you need to seek out a copy of the old book so that you can settle down with your evening cocoa and browse through these pages of family trees as you doze off. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for sticking with it and getting to the end of the Talk Genealogy podcast. And there wasn't even a second mention of Ivanhoe. Just a reminder that the show notes and other goodies are available on the website talkgenealogy.blog. And of course, there's now the Facebook page as well. I'm posting this episode on the 3rd of April 2018. Another episode will be available from 7.30pm UK time on the 3rd of May. However, the schedule is getting somewhat overcrowded, so I might slip in a bonus episode before then. 
As usual, I need to thank Freeze Effect for the music, Emily Brooks for the voiceover, and especially thank you for being there. It really does make a difference. And please do put in any ideas for any future episodes that you'd like to hear. I've already built some episodes around the emails from listeners, and I look forward to doing more of that in the months to come. So come on, please speak up. In the meantime, good luck with your ancestor hunting. And as always, good night and God bless. Building an audio library for the genealogists with too much time on their hands. 